Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to HR Katha Presents Happiness at Work, powered by happiness.me. As you all must be aware, Happiness at Work is a video series where we discuss different facets of employee happiness with corporate leaders across the country. Today, we have Ritu Raina, CHRO Quickie, who will share with us her definition of happiness and how she practices happiness at the workplace. Welcome to the show, Ritu. Thank you so much for having me here. And I'm very interested in this topic because being in HR, this is the question which we always have. And I just want to share a kind of parable here before we actually get into the definition. Man sure. created all the comfort around him and all the modernization just to be happy, but discovered that once he got everything around him, he was still not happy. Mm-hmm. And when we look at it, you know, uh, it's very, I would say, ironical to see many practices which had started in the erstwhile era when there were no, not many such comforts. We are trying to bring back those practices. Let me simply give you one simple example of this digitalization. We were in the aha of digitalization when mobile started way back in 96, 97. And we started gluing it, you know, so convenient. I can call anyone, anytime, no hassle. Suddenly, it started getting so much into us. Today, we want to have conversations with people which are missing. So I think, uh, so by saying this, what I want to say is that happiness cannot be externalized. The external world cannot give me happiness. Happiness has to come within. And I think the focus, uh, happiness is a state where you are with yourself and you enjoy being in yourself. And I think that is what is missing as and when the time is passing by. And I want to share an example here. You know, when we uh, this pandemic started off, uh, initial, I would say 15 to 20 days were happy days for employees. No manager, no boss, no travel plan. And now travel time, everything is fine. Well, After 20 work, days, work from your home, you know, correct. From, After from 20 work, days, it became a burden on them. Now, just think about it. Situation gives me a happiness for 20 days. After 20 days, I feel burnout. So again, when I externalize it, I can never get it. It has to be, it has to come from internally. So that's my take on that. Okay. Tell me something, you know, but as you said, you know, there are, there can't be any external forces to make people happy, you know. But uh, as a business or as an organization, today companies are strategizing to, uh, you know, keep their employees happy. That's a business, that happiness has become a business goal, you know, correct, correct. For, uh, for companies. How do you do that, you know, if, 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 you know, happiness is something that comes from within. Yes, of course, happiness comes from within, you know. It is very difficult to, you know, make someone happy if that person doesn't want to be happy. But how do you? But there is still that companies follow. How do you do that? Okay, so uh, I think um, thanks for this question because the answer is almost in the first question itself, but it's about how you position it. Yeah. Uh, for any situation, there's a stimulus and there's a response, right? Now, yes. of course, happiness comes from within. But what do you create in the ecosystem to comfort a person which makes him happy internally rather than externally? And one of my observations has been there are two approaches to bring happiness at the workplace. One is, are you connecting with head of people or are you connecting with heart of people? When I say so, let me give you a simple example. My logical brain says, I gave my employees all the benefits. They have got gym, they have got yoga, they have got blah, 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 blah. Everything is there in place. So I am with logical reason, with head, I am giving them everything. Yeah, I'm giving them everything which is connected to the head, which is connected to the rational part of it. But when they come, their manager doesn't even know whether this person exists, what is happening in his family, does he have any challenges, is he going through some stress, 
because for him i have given you a good salary i gave you a fancy office all the perks blah blah so now if you see the approach one it is you are connecting to the employees head and you are doing a checklist as an organization i have done a b c and d automatically program it programmed human being he should be happy but it doesn't happen that way because human being is an embodiment of emotions and if someone you know he walks in and his manager says your face looks swollen on a teams call was there any issue how was your night Are, is everyone okay at your home i think this conversation makes much more difference than giving him all the you know rational things which makes them happy and what is irony happening in today's world i'm sure you know you must be reading so many articles about talent scarcity you know i am in the cyber security industry i would say we are at the um, biggest challenge in our sector for the talent now what is the response of organizations to it give them fancy bikes give them big joining bonuses yes it would make them happy no doubts but will it continue answer is no i think what is important for the corporates is not to do short term things but create healthy cultures a culture where every human being is valued and trust me when you make human being valued when you connect to his heart than to his head eventually he or she starts feeling happy happy because again happiness is an emotion which gets triggered from inside and that emotion can be triggered when you make you feel valued even by just taking care asking simple questions so what i was saying is that uh, you know the other day i read it somewhere that organizations now are you know you know they 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 are training people to be happy do you think you know these kind of uh, things work are they you know can you train someone to be happy uh, you know or, or these are just gimmicks of course you cannot you cannot and you know i just want to give you a simple example i'm sure you must have yeah. also observed when the pandemic started we yeah. saw a mushroom growth of mental well-being consultants yes everybody People was changed their profession overnight and you know they would write yeah. you on mail and all that and it is very funny and sometimes i even feel sad because i think there are two components in life and in op- op- corporates there is business and there is life the moment you try to treat life as a business you start losing it and when you say that people start talking about training on happiness they're actually making a business out of it because you cannot train anyone to be happy it's not a muscle it's an emotion muscle can be built but emotion you know cannot be created unless or until someone feels it i think uh, this pandemic and the situation really taught us a lot of things and one of the things which it taught us which which was diluted over a period of time that we are living souls who need their space and empowerment and i want to just give a very simple example there was a tendency in organization and in managers if i don't see a person i don't feel that he is working yeah he has to come to office right suddenly this myth got busted right similarly when we talk about happiness it's not about what you make other you know what what do you create a happy ecosystem around but it's about how you really make other person feel i think rather than doing training on happiness we should be focusing on creating well being and sense of accomplishment in our employees because if you may make it do that it will really become much much more easier for you to de- deliver things uh, unfortunately uh, you know when a cfo goes to a ceo with an excel sheet or a balance sheet he can see the roi but when a chro goes and then he says i want this investment he says what is the roi and suddenly the ceo starts realizing about that roi when people start exiting i'm sure you must have you know recently seen in the news on the cognizant board said that we have not done well because we had challenge with the human resources which means we didn't have enough people to deliver the project yeah 
Now, we reach that stage because we treat life as business. Life is life. Business is business. It has to be given its own value and place. So that's what I really feel. What, what are the things, you know, at Quick Heal, what are the, if I ask you, you know, what are the five things that you do to keep your employees happy? You know, is it the culture that makes employees happy? Is it yes. the practices? Of this? What, what is the life and soul of an organization, you know, which ensures that people would be happy? I think uh, uh, it is culture and practices both. And I will give you an example. Uh, you know, two and a half years back, if I would have seen our employee engagement scores or our glass door scores, they were, you know, at an average. Today, if I see our glass door scores, they are almost more than 1.5 times, which it was in the last last time, uh, one and a half year back. Our ESAT scores have gone up. What does it mean? Have we really tried to create uh, some happiness training? Answer is no. There has been a significant shift which we have tried to do through the culture. Now, culture is a very, I would say, abused term. Sorry for the word. But yeah. everything you can't blame on the culture. Yeah, on the culture. Culture is not about creating fancy posters and putting on the walls. Culture is about the practices on the floor. And what we felt, one of the things in Quake Heal, that if we are able to focus and create the managers who are both IQ and EQ balanced, it will start making an impact on our own employees. And we, you know, when we did our employee engagement survey, we actually created manager scorecards, not to penalize the managers, but we wanted to tell them that this is you are really great at. We recognize the role models and people who needed help, we helped them with coaching and external support to help and build them. Now, this was taken as a business, not that this is nice nice to have thing because if a manager has served us for 10 years it is my responsibility to help and build him if he has some black spots so i think we focused on these managers and this really helped us in seeing a change on the ground and the second thing what we did was how do we make our policies in such a way that people feel that they are trusted and they are empowered simple thing we said we will remove the attendance policy oh, because, you know, uh, I don't want to monitor people for nine hours, walk in and walk out. They are at home. Let them join in when they want to. I have focused on the outcome. I think when we actually made a change in the attendance policy, some were very happy, some were shocked and someone said, oh, what is happening in the company? They are losing the control. They will have no clue about how things are happening. But trust me, three to six months down the line, we saw a positive outcome of that. What we realized is people didn't count the weekends because we trusted them. Second thing, what is a change we made is that we said that performance is a process, but we didn't want the performance process to be a review process. We actually got uh, the, we moved away completely from MBO to OKRs, okay. where we said that goals are dynamic. Every quarter employee can go and change it. Maybe outcome manager can decide, but you have. So we created a bottom-up approach in that entire process. So when we bought these changes, they were changes connected to the heart, not to the head. It was not a Zumba class where they were getting entertained, but it was about something which was really feeling in their skin, in their body, they were feeling empowered. And I think that started uh, you know, bringing the change. And trust me, if you trust people, they deliver. Because with the freedom comes responsibility. And with responsibility comes ownership. And if we use this circle other way around, that I will control you, you have to build the ownership, you know, you see the outcomes also come in a similar way. I, I know I, I strongly believe that, you know, the culture of a place is basically it's it's the interpersonal relationship that exists. In the company, exactly. it is the interpersonal relationship between the boss and the subordinate, or among our team members. If I'm coming to an office and then if I'm not happy, I'm just saying, if my if my colleagues don't talk to me, if we don't share our lunch together, what is the culture? I, culture is that you know, a culture is not something which you can define or you know you can structure it. I I personally don't think so. You know it. Exactly. And, you know, I think the only thing which we have in our hands is 
which behaviors are we recognizing for example if you are being you have a high camaraderie am i recognizing that behavior as an organization whether in town halls whatever so when you start recognizing that behavior it starts becoming culture yeah if you will reprimand that behavior the person will move out and then you will have a different set of people whom you are rewarding so i think the only input as you rightly mentioned culture is everyone in the organization the only input which can help us in making it better is our reward and reprimand um, you know philosophy yeah, what are we rewarding toxic, what are we reprimand the certain toxic behaviors has to be curtailed you know correct correct somebody if somebody is not behaving rightly we need to pull that person whoever okay. it, it is just absolutely what, what what is you you know how do you perceive you know personally you know how do you uh, perceive happiness both you know at your personal level and at your professional level i would say you know in a simple sentence happiness is are you in peace with yourself that is my simple definition if you are not in peace with yourself you can never be happy and trust me there is no one lives an ideal life no one no we always have an ideal aspirations but achievements are never ideal <laughs> now how you decide that what is my role in making myself happy and if you take ownership for your happiness and you make you are at you eventually start having peace with yourself it would start making you happy because the moment you say that i do not have any problem problem is with the external world you know i didn't get the right spouse i didn't get the right family i didn't get the right organization there is neither a right spouse there is neither a right organization there are neither a right children yeah so i think how you uh, you know see what is my role in making myself happy and how do i create my own peace moment you have answer to these two questions i think you are bound to to go in the direction of happiness do you think that the parameters of happiness has changed over the years you know today's uh, for today's generation if i say you know is it driven by success or is it driven by achievement uh, and for uh, you, know, you know i don't know whether you are aware i had done a research on millennials a uh, few yeah. years back 2013 14 and when i did that research and i want to connect that on answer to the new generation yes, yes. it was very interesting i must have studied i know 100 plus organization i went and i spoke to people i published shr published my research okay it was very really interesting to see at that point in time the uh, i would say um, black spots or ignorance which i had towards this generation okay when i say so see the earlier generation if you see uh, the gen generation x my generation your generation yeah. we came from a seat of scarcity yes we had to earn for living to be honest right yes. so yes. whatever my boss says i will bear it because i can't afford to let go my salary yeah retaining that job was very important yeah. eventually what happened with this generation they came from a seat of abundance why they came from a seat of abundance because it was not a licensed or regimented world it was a not networked economy if you are smart intelligent world is connected to this global world you can really make a mark and you can pursue what you want to do so now when a person comes from abundance what happens to him is his habits go bad because he hasn't seen the scarcity he may not be disciplined but the plus point is if he goes behind south uh, in something he will pursue it with his full heart and soul so they need the a purpose always, in life they need a purpose to okay so i think that is what is the major difference you know i see how do you and i think the most important thing is like the generation x they they don't like the subordinate sub, like to be subordinate they want to be partners with you So the moment like the hierarchical level right. so if you treat them as partners e equals they will deliver value for you and many times i have seen the conflict is between gen x and gen y or millennials because x feels i have lived life this way why can't this he live life that way why can't he come at 7am what is this getting at at 10am i think that is more 
to be, you know, those differences have to be understood and have, we have to accept them as different beings who have come from abundance. So people not accepting the changes, I think, leads to certain some kind of unhappiness or or disconnect between the two generations. That's exactly you know. exactly. Okay, uh, you you know you generally uh, you know I think you have spent quite a few years in the IT sector. Yeah, yeah. So do you think you know the the happiness quotient in the IT companies? Because they have got a very different set of employees, you know. It's different from, say, the traditional companies or, uh, or you know, the it could be a manufacturing company or it could be, um, you know, a BFSI or, or, you know, any other sector. You know, the IT, the quotient of happiness, because people are different, you know. Is it different would, from the traditional? Would, do you compare that too? Or? I would slightly disagree here. People are not different. People are same. Yeah. I will tell you where is the difference. See, under you know, if I have to really answer this question, I will go deeper to the business model. Look at the model of a BFSI. Look yeah. at the model of a manufacturing. They have a process. There is a plant. There is a plan. Human being or an employee is a part of that plan. Yeah. I have to run this machine. I have to run this process. I have to do the innovation and I have to deliver. BFSI again, the same way. When you look at IT, it was a cultural shock to me because I joined from BFSI after 10 years. When you know, 10 years I have been now in uh, IT. So it was a cultural shock for me first day when I went to the office because coming from a BFSI, uh, it was in a very formal setup, 9 a.m. wearing a sari, coming to the office, and I suddenly see people in floaters yeah. and you know, uh, you know, shorts. And you no, know, I was like, oh my God, what are, are they coming to office or is the gym? Then I figured out there's a gym also. Then I saw, you know, it, it took it took me at least a 15 or one 15 years or one month to say that this is also a way of life coming from BFSI. Now, keeping that aside, coming to the business model for an IT company, what is the product they have? The product they have, the code which these folks generate, the services which they give to the client. Now, because of that, they they have to really value these employees a lot. Now, unfortunately, what has happened in the process in the past five to six years is that this uh, valuing has got shifted to pampering. And that has, which has really, you know, kind of put the whole thing into, uh, I would say, different fashion altogether. So they are they, they, their business model uh, makes them valuable. So open organization takes care of them differently because of which they become the pampered. And when they become pampered for the prima facie, when you look from outside, a guy, uh, employee from uh, manufacturing, you say, wow, what a nice person. He comes on time. He follows the process. He asks questions, but not too many. This guy is crazy. What is he wearing? What is he doing? And he's asking double the salary to the next job. So I think when we shifted as organizations from creating value and making them feel valuable to pampering, we really created, I would say, a problem for us. And today, if you see what is happening, I am giving you 20%, the other company is saying 50%. I will give this is a madness. Who is it helping? It's, it's not helping the country because we are losing our edges in outsourcing uh, hub. It is not helping the employee because he's whole, you know, he has golden handcuffs over a period of time. He will become unemployable and we are losing cost as an organization. So I think that is our way of response to the stimulus of employee is what makes them different. And eventually they have started feeling that they are God's gift to mankind. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I know. So it is like, uh, I would say, you know, it is uh, we, you know, who have helped them shape like that, you know. We exactly. have created this world, uh, you know, and, and plus what I think is that, you know, in the IT sector, these things are visible. You are talking about the pampering because that pampering happens. These things are because people are so important, you know. Correct, 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 correct. If this guy goes, my billing for this project will go for it. Now, yeah. As simple as that. But while in manufacturing, it is different, you know, it is. The, the machines are also important, so as the people. So both are equally... I think the one more thing is there, you know, these industrial manufacturing and other sectors, they have been there for long. Yeah. 
their processes are deeper they have successions in place they have integral training programs in place in it suddenly the growth came so there were i am you know being from the same sector i can you know say that we don't have those deeper processes as manufacturing and as vfsi has so because for us there was a huge demand supply gap always so we wanted to say so theek hai kal ki to i'll think about tomorrow tomorrow let me think about today am i getting my right people so i think that is also created a kind of more uh, feeling of uh, this that they are very indispensable the it employees so do you think that will change that the correction would happen at certain point of time it has to happen i don't think it has a choice it has okay. to happen just remember 2008 yeah what was happening in the market it was madness and if you look at that time specific to india uh the bfsi sector especially insurance and broking it was going crazy yeah and when the subprime right crisis hit yeah. everything fall in fla- play, uh, place i think the same thing would happen correction is required it can't continue to be the same pace as it is today okay you know how would be you know these uh, uh, if you know, again you know uh, we were talking about the new age companies it sector is there plus there are also new age companies they are so dependent on people and their business is so much dependent in talent on talent actually that they are forced to you know pamper their employees and unlike what happens in a you know a you know a traditional set, sector how how difficult does it be make it for people who want to move from these new age companies to a traditional sector you know they, they will be totally would say they will never be able to work in the traditional sector because you know i have seen both i have worked for a manufacturing for a small time then i worked into bfsi and then it i have been for a long time uh of course you know when i take my i will give you my personal example i felt you know a bit shocked for some time and then you know i eventually became a part for me it was still an up up curve when i say up curve i was yeah. moving from controls to empowerment i was moving from processes to being feeling better and you know focusing a lot on thinking now the people who have worked in the new age technology companies they can never work in traditional sectors because if you look philosophically the muscle for both is different because the muscle for the traditional sectors is about process orientation is about uh, you know efficiencies is about compliance the new age is about innovation breakthrough uh, thinking so for that you want to force that employee to be comfortable to reach to the stage where he gets that kick and he really innovates and brings the disruption so it is very very difficult for the people who are working in the new age companies to move to the traditional companies i'm not too sure you know if they would be able to work because i always use this parable of the freshers who joined us in lockdown i said poor kids they never saw office right yeah. coding and everything so for them the office they saw was a laptop the day they have to come to the office they will be shocked because in few shocks they will have oh i have to swipe the card i can't leave out of office before 5 or 6 how do i leave my manager is in the next room yeah so this is a small thing which has got changed think about similar experience of traditional guy moving at new age moving to a traditional would happen Then, uh, you know the other day i was talking to somebody and they said you know i was generally talking about you know how do you keep you know it is very difficult to keep everyone happy you know and as an you know as an hr professional or an as an hr leader your job is to keep everyone happy you know everyone satisfied in the organization i said it is very difficult because even in our family we are not able to keep everyone happy we can't keep all our friends happy you know so how do you do that is it the challenge is where is it the the junior employees or you know the, the somebody who has started their career or is it the mid level or the senior level senior level you know the, the i think uh, it is all across i would say it depends on the sector and the organization you work for and i would say uh, some kind of mistake we have done in hr by saying that you know our role is to keep everyone happy i think our role is to keep everyone real and everyone practical 
that this is how it works if we do this this could be quite because at the end of the day even people are owned by their respective managers we are enablers and i am sure you know you must have seen this trend when a manager has to recognize sometimes he will recognize himself but when he has to fire someone he will say call the hr manager call the hr business partner isko fire karna hai no all those things will happen you know yeah Correct. so now i think the expectation setting that i am here to enable you to for your people practices but at the end of the day you have to own up your people and i would say one good thing which happened with this pandemic is that the role perception of hr actually moved away from being submissive or being at the back end to the front end because that at least is a phase where we should assert it more and more saying that you know yes uh, uh, my job is to keep you happy but more than happy i want to give you a practical and a real advice this is how it should work and i would say one more thing as an hr leader or as an hr manager we should have our own priority matrices what we can let go what we cannot let go what is critical and what is not so critical as you rightly mentioned it's impossible to keep everyone happy so we have to actually have our own matrices our priority uh, things clear so that we can let go of wherever we have to let go of so we can create a basically the job is for hr that you know they create a level playing ground for everyone exactly. and 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 create an uh, you know a world which is justified rather than Absolutely. you know trying to because you know if i create a level playing field i think some people will fall in place some people will have to move on depending exactly. on their personal uh, agenda in in life how do you think the workforce or the the workplace has changed over the years you know the happiness question the our aspirations how has it changed over the years you know since you started your career has uh, you know the benchmark of again you know the happiness changed i think uh, benchmark for happiness has not changed if you ask me i'm answering this question more personally yeah yeah people yeah. want more money but they are less happy this is my personal experience you know i remember when i joined as a management trainee and i started my career way back with reliance tele reliance communications industries and then communications we were so happy with whatever salary we were getting and even if our manager would keep us till whatever time we would say it's an obligation i have got a job yeah. and i am getting a salary right so i think over a period of time even if you you are throwing they first feel that money is not keeping them happy they need more money even if you give them more money they still don't feel happy i think uh, it's not only about the organization that is how what is happening to the world I, and i going back to my opening uh, conversation with you uh, world has to move to the basics world has to move to the basics and if more for that more simple yes, signal yeah yes more simple step more grounded i think that is the only way to move forward minimalist life i think that that uh, yes. organizations need to practice that you know it's absolutely uh, i think everybody has got into a competition of uh, you know sh showing or portraying that we keep our employees happy rather than trying to do it i think exactly is, uh, and uh, connecting every time to the head connecting every time to the head i checklist checklist doesn't you know uh, checklist doesn't really help correct so checklist you know if checklist should have helped uh, all the marriages would have been successful because yeah. you meet all the checklists but still you separations happen so checklists don't help it's about the you know uh, how the other person is feeling are you really making him feel empowered are you making him feel comfortable are you trusting him most important thing but do you, do you think the more the newer generation is more uh... accommodative than the 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 senior guys the senior guys are more great masters you think so uh i would say uh, you know younger generation has many advantages they are more flexible their learning orientation is very high if you make them believe in something they will run behind that uh they need more emotional connect uh than anything else the older generation uh needs more ego satisfaction 
because they have come from those times of hierarchies Hierarchy. those class systems which newer generation doesn't have and i think uh, this what i was talking to you about the potential conflict of yeah. between x and y which happens in the workplace is mainly because of this right so i think yeah. that and out of all this if organization focus on one element i really believe we can change the world which is empathy as a manager how much empathy you have as an employee how much empathy if we are able to live by empathy in the organizations we really need not to throw money yes it is important to throw money because people don't want to work for free and people have to be reasonably paid but if we start you know practicing empathy it will start changing our equation with our employees especially the younger generations and you know they would be delivering much much better results and staying high higher with us okay and 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 what about ownership you know do you think that the, the sense of ownership has changed over the years you know there uh, many many years back i used to do workshops in my previous assignments in my, one of the organization there used to be a principle called o's principle o's principle of accountability you know see it do it own it lead it and own it and lead it right yeah. and we used to run workshops 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 and i am again sharing the personal experience after a few years i actually realized that you know i am showing them a process for something which they will do process but they may not still get me the outcome because i have done as per my job description so this is my ownership and you know when i was working in amdocs one of the biggest challenges which we were facing you know when these new generation people used to come in is that okay project mein there has a fall who's mistake no one is ready to take blah 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 and what i we realized i did a lot of discussions across with the employees and leaders and i realized that we make a boundary around them by their job descriptions if we remove the boundary and say what is your purpose what is your identity what is what is anchoring you and that anchor is based on the outcome people will start owning it now going back to your question if to this newer generation i show o's principle he will yeah. google it and he will give me 10 principles back yeah no what do i do with those principles right you can't I make have, it they, they they are so you know you really need to i don't know what actually you know uh, they need to really believe in something they need a rational to believe you correct, know correct. to practice so that so means that if i make him a partner in this journey and say hey look if we do this we are going to do it this way and if we do it you will really help me with it and i think that is uh, how things can change for this generation this can you know change for organization they have to look at a different uh, with a different lenses and work with the earlier generation which has to th start thinking about that they can't uh, create their own clones we are dealing with a different generation and and how do you keep the you know how do you what are the motivational factors or or your triggers uh, of you know happiness for the the mid level and senior level people is it you know the uh, stability in the job is it you know achievement is it what 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 may keeps them happy you know generally we keep on talking about the younger generation younger generation we generally don't talk about happiness among we assume that you know they would be happy in certain way i think i will answer this question more from an it perspective and what happens in it uh, there is a huge mid manager flux because think you know when a coder or a developer joins he is he's hands on he's coding when he goes to the senior management he's driving business when he's in the middle he's somewhere lost right i think as organizations we should take ownership on ourselves to make these people feel relevant because they have an experience now how do we fit their experience into business our business model how do we make them feel relevant and how you we make them feel recognized is equally important and you have really bought a very good point uh, we don't mind throwing a money on a infra or a cloud developer because it's a scarce talent in the market and if i don't get it my project will suffer i have a project manager maybe marginally with a higher salary than him who has served me for 15 years yeah. i need to equally respect that person as well and help him feel relevant and you know make him feel part of the whole organization 
and his experience also has a value for the organization it's up to the organization how they want to you know make them uh, uh, feel or recognize that i think that's what is more important make them feel relevant don't make them dysfunctional recognize them as and when their experience has something to offer to the organization is organization leveraging that i think that's what is important at this generation yeah and i have seen yes there the, the mid level managers are always under threat you know under the threat that you know i might lose my job what what is next is actually bothering them uh, that's what i think you know and and generally it is the truth that you know if somebody loses a job at a 40 45 it is very difficult to get another job you know unless you have totally reinvented yourself or you know you are so technically sound you know absolutely how long can you uh, do that tell me something you know do you believe in pearl space service and uh, you know of course you yes, yes. okay so i what, i know it, in fact esat i feel is a very long drawn because it happens once in a year yeah. pulse gives us a lot of information a lot of information because you know organization is like a body you don't know what tensions are in which pockets and uh, those tensions are going on those pockets and you only realize those tensions if people start exiting or something starts happening drastically there pulse is a place which gives you a red flag much in advance that this is what is going to really happen and uh, we should take care of these things so i think uh, since uh, or if i have to use a parable of family for an organization organization is very big you can't have conversations pulse is those conversations those informal talks to ask everyone and knock their door and say hey how are you doing is all okay but 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 do you get actually honest answers during a pulse survey or it it is very uh, you know uh, it 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 is very uh, you know designed in a certain way that you will get certain answers is it uh, yeah, or it is you know that the real uh, picture comes out i think it's again you know how is the culture of the organization do you really want to hear from employees or do you want to design what you want to hear from your employees are you connected to the heart and checklist then you will design what you want to hear from the employees if you are connected to the heart then you will say i don't want to design what i want to hear from the employees i want to hear from employees what they have to say and if you do that as an organization you will have better retention you will have eng- better engagement it may take you time in the first approach it is a shortcut and it is not a sustainable model but generally what do people do generally people uh, you know, i can talk from my practice uh, to be honest yeah. i yeah. think from my practice i have always and believed that you should go to the heart you should go to the long term and trust me if you take your ceo if you take your leadership on board they will support you for sure even if it goes a dip it's okay but you know we have we 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 have to remove the root cause rather than doing a surgical dressing so it's it's like you know if you want to uh, you know get the true diagnosis done you know you will uh, have a heart to heart conversation and try exactly. to figure out the real problems if you want uh, you know a diagnosis which says no no everything is okay then that's a different story yeah yeah so uh, that was great talking to you ritu you know and thank you for your time and inputs uh, that was that was ritu raina today you know sharing her thoughts and practices on employee happiness great to have you on the show thank you so much and it was a pleasure speaking to you thank you take care bye